you have your Bibles or if you have the Canvas app, the words will also be on the screen as well. But we're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 8 today. We're going to pick up in this narrative where Jesus is at in his life. And just to give you a little glimpse of what's happening in John chapter 8, Jesus is now in his earthly ministry. He's, he's alive and awake, and he is doing everything he can with relentless ambition to lead people to God. The problem was Jesus was viewed as this time as a massive rebel. The Pharisees of that time, which were the religious teachers, they had this disgust for this man named Jesus, because he did not do things by the book. What we're going to see today is a story of these religious teachers who try to create this trap to catch Jesus in. And we're going to see what I firmly believe is one of the most beautiful ways that Jesus rebukes religion and calls people into a fully alive life. So if you look at John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse number 2. It says this, At dawn, Jesus, he appeared in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in this woman that was caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So now, Jesus, what do you say? See, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him, for accusing Jesus. But Jesus, this is the weird part, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, it says that he straightened, uh, he straightened up. He stood up, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stoops down, and he writes on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightens up again and asks her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declares. So go now and leave your life of sin. If you're taking notes today, um, I want you to write this down because this is going to be the foundation for today's entire discussion. If you're going to write anything down, if you walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away with this, that your highest calling is not defined by your lowest moments, that your highest calling the calling that God has given you to your soul and to your life, it is not defined by your lowest moment. Have you ever been caught in like a really bad moment? Yeah, word. <laughs> I'm going to share with you a story this morning of something that happened two weeks ago. Y'all, it was probably the most embarrassing moments of my entire life. And for transparency's sake, just please feel for me during this. You, you'll see. It's pretty bad. Okay. So I, I live in the Presidio. We go to the YMCA, which uh, y'all canvas Amanda Abels. She goes here. She runs that whole place. If you're looking for a gym, go to the YMCA. I hope I get a discount by saying that. Um, <laughs> So if you're looking for a gym, YMCA Presidio, it's so awesome. Except for what I did one day when I went there. I go there almost every day. Love the place. It's great. Walk in, and in the locker room, they have this thing. You, you open this door, and in front of you, before you hit the locker, the actual locker room, there's these two curtains that are in front of you. And the, the whole premise is you're supposed to shut the door behind you and then walk through the curtain so no one can see in. I, I, I don't do that. This is what I do. I just open and just kind of go through, not like that, but like, just like, I go into the locker room. That was weird. Um, so something happened a couple weeks ago that destroyed my heart. So I open the locker room door, and I don't wait for the door to shut behind me. I, I just uh, go right through the locker room. Now, I can already see y'all's faces of what you think is going to happen. Trust me, <laughs> it's not what you think it is. Um, I go through the curtains, and there is an elderly man in a wheelchair right in front of the curtain in a wheelchair. 
And I go through the curtain, and I bump right into the back of his wheelchair. Again, this is not going where you think it's going. You see, he didn't fall out of his wheelchair. Um, He didn't get hurt. The reason why he was in front of the curtain was because he was putting on his prosthetic leg. And I go through the curtain, and this man's leg gets chucked out of his hands because of how hard I hit the back of his wheelchair. Yeah, you all feel for me. It was awful. It it was one of those moments, have you ever been in one of those moments where you're like, this is so bad and embarrassing that, like, this isn't real? Like, this is a dream. This this is not actually, that was me in this moment. I literally hit the back of his wheelchair so hard that his prosthetic leg literally rolls to the other side of the locker room. And so this is what I have to do. I have to go around him, and I took what seemed like a mile-long walk to pick up this man's leg that I just picked up, or that I just made come out of his hands, and I pick it up, and then I look him right in the eye, which was the worst mistake. And I take this, like, long trek back to him, holding this man's leg. And I hand it to him and say, I am so sorry. Y'all, it was really bad. Now, I'm hoping, like, some part of me is hoping that this man will just, like, kind of, like, laugh it off, like, make a joke. Like, a big portion of me is really wanting this man to laugh at this moment. He didn't. Um, This is is what he did. Um, He just looks at me and says, hey, that's okay. It happens. I'm like, no. I need you to laugh at this. Like, this is a really bad moment for me. And it was like I just knocked, like, his cup of water off his table or something. Like, it was just, hey, it happens. It is what it is. I give the man, I give the man his leg back, and I walk out of the locker room, go into the gym, and I do what all of us would probably do in that moment. I text my pastor, Pastor Travis. Yeah, y'all, y'all know where this is going. I text him and be like, I'm going to hell. This is what happened hoping that he sends me back something of assurance of affirmation, sends me back a text that says, wow, yeah, you are, see ya, fire emoji. (laughs) This is your pastor. (laughs) And so now that my eternity is apparently, you know, um, going down, um, I I text Amanda Abel's. Actually, I email her with the subject line, I'm definitely going to hell, and let her know that this happened. If she hears about it, I'll never walk through those doors ever again. Really bad moment in my life. Um, Have you ever had one of those embarrassing moments happen in your life? Where, like, you wish you could go back, like, 30 seconds in time and just take, like, your time going through that curtain. Um, Then there's times in our life where we wish that the mistake that we made, the moments that happen in our lives, we wish we could go back in time and just remove those from our timeline. Have you ever been there before? I'm sure all of us have found ourselves in this place where we just wish that this thing never happened. And I bet even some of you have felt like that your future was over because of what has happened in the past. This is what's happening to this woman in this story. We see in this story, we see Jesus teaching, doing what he does best, having conversations, uh, having talks with people in this community. We see this woman being brought into her lowest moment. And not even just her lowest moment in life, she's caught in it and then dragged out in the middle of a crowd and put in front of the physical embodiment of God. Like, just put yourself in her shoes for a second. The lowest moment that you've had in your life, what if Jesus was there right in front of you? This is what this moment looks like, this mistake, this this low portion of this woman's life. This is what she's living at this time, in John chapter 8, where we see this story first kick off is this woman being dragged out to Jesus. What I think is so almost ironic uh, about this story is this, that, that the teachers of Jesus, the teachers, the people who were entrusted to teach others about God, 
are the ones that are trying to catch Jesus in a trap. You see, they, what, this is what they believe, that the Pharisees believe that Jesus was this rebel. He, he's not the son of God. This is not the king of kings. This is not the man who's coming and seeking to save those who are lost. This man is the devil, and he needs to die. And so what they do is they start putting together this trap. And they find this woman having sex with someone who wasn't her husband. And they take her out and put her in front of Jesus. And they say this. They look at Jesus and say, teacher, like, come on. Like, these guys were not looking at Jesus to be taught. These guys were the, the keepers of the law, and they're trying to tell Jesus what the law is, the man who created the law, right? And they put this woman in front of her, and, and in front of him, and they say, Jesus, we just caught this woman in the lowest moment of her life. Now, you gave Moses this law, this commandment that says that we are supposed to kill her because of what she's done. So, Jesus, what do you say that we should do? You see, they were trying to get Jesus to choose between grace and judgment. This is what we see in this story. These Pharisees throwing this woman in the middle of her worst moment in front of the king of kings. This is what I find so interesting about this story. That the focal point of this story is not Jesus. The, 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 the main point of this is not the Pharisees, but it's this woman who gets no say in her life. Have you ever been in one of those moments before? What we're going to do is we're going to pick up the rest of the story from there, and we're going to look at three different things, three different words that I found in this that may apply to you. And we see what Jesus does, and we can see how we're supposed to live our lives in the same capacity. The first word is this, surround surround. This is what we see in this story. We see this woman put in the middle of this group between Jesus, between this crowd that's listening to Jesus and these Pharisees. And she is surrounded by all of these people in her life who have no clue who she is, caught in her lowest moment. And these men have made her an object lesson to try to trap Jesus. And this is what we see that these Pharisees didn't believe for one moment that Jesus had anything to teach them. John, again, he makes it clear that this is a trap. And the reason why this is so big is because this woman is the focal point, and yet because of her mistake, she doesn't get a say. Have you ever been there before? Where you don't get a say in the matter? If we were to step in that woman's shoes, it was this point that she was surrounded by these men with stones in their hands. Literally, because of this mistake, she's looking death in the eye. There's no hope for her. She's made this mistake. She, she's messed up. And she's found in her lowest moment, and she's dragged out in front of Jesus, and he's staring her down. I think what we see in this story is that this woman was surrounded by people outside of Jesus, people that uh, wanted to catch her in her worst mistake. See, this woman didn't get the option to choose who she surrounds herself with. And I think sometimes in our lives, we've maybe found ourselves in that same way. We found ourselves in the situation where we can't pick who we surround ourselves with. But this is the thing that I really want us to dive into today, that there are times in our life where we have the option to choose who we surround ourselves with. There's even options and power that lets you choose what mistakes you let stay in your mind. You see, this woman, I think a lot of times she was still tasting death because these stones that were about ready to be thrown at her, and she didn't have her friends, her family around her. She needed people around her to support her in this situation, which brings me to this question. If we were going to relate this story to our lives, it's this question. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Who is it in your life that's either speaking life or speaking death into you? I think a lot of times that we forget about that, that we have the power to choose who surrounds us. And I think a lot of times in our lives, we have people that speak illness and toxicity 
in our lives. We've allowed these people to have equity in our souls, in our hearts, and we allow them to capture us and keep us in our worst moments. And I think this is huge. That it doesn't matter what, whether someone is a relative, a romantic interest, an employer, a childhood friend, or a new acquaintance. You don't have to make room for people who cause you pain or make you feel small. It's one thing if a person owns up to their behavior, makes an effort to change. But if a person disregards your feelings, if that person ignores your boundaries, or continues to treat you in a harmful way, then they need to be removed from your life. If you have people in your life that are ready to throw those stones at you, you have the option to walk away from toxic relationships. We must, we must remove people from our lives who are there to hold us back and who will not allow us to become who we were created to be. We must remove people who do not allow us to step into the future that God has called us to create. Now, I want to make a little bit of a narrative swerve here. I want to ask you a second question. How many times have we seen someone in their lowest moment and we've thought to ourselves, I would ne never do that? You see, as I started digging into this story, I found something that um, uh, troubled me. You see, I'm looking at it from the woman's perspective, the victim. And as I dig deep into this story, I realize that a lot of times I'm more like the Pharisee than I am the woman. That a lot of times it's not me trying to block the stones that are being thrown at me, but it's the stone that's in my hand. How about you? I think this is huge if we look at this narrative from a different perspective, from a different character, from the character of the Pharisees. Uh, there are times in my life where I feel like this woman, and there's times where I feel like this Pharisee, and I think sometimes we are so quick to cast judgment on other people. But if I've found anything true in life, it is this, that when you judge someone, you are not defining who they are. You are defining who you are. When we speak illness, when we speak mistakes and moments moments of regret and pain and suffering back into people, we are saying who we are, not who they are. I think this is huge, and this is also something that I think we need to understand. Why do we do this? Why is it that we feel like we feel the need to judge other people? I feel like the reason why we need to cast this condemnation onto other people is simply because we are afraid of looking into the core of who we are, because I think sometimes in the core of who we are, we can find brokenness and hurt and anger and pain. The person who is throwing those stones is just as broken as the woman who is getting thro stones thrown at her. And the reason we feel the need to hurt others is because we don't want to deal with the hurt that exists inside of our soul. So who are you in this story? You could be this woman who is caught in her lowest moment. What if you had the option to surround yourself with people that instead of throwing stones at you, would lift you up out of the dirt? But I think a lot of times we can also be the person holding that stone. What would it look like for us to simply drop our stones and walk away from casting judgment onto other people? Maybe today you're one two of these people. And so, surround. Who do we surround ourselves with in our life? Here, here's the next point. The next point is this, stand. The first one is this, surround. Who are you surrounding yourself with? The second one is this, stand. So, we get to the next part of the story of Jesus, where he responds to these teachers. And this is what I love, this is what I love about this story. We see Jesus, the, the greatest communicator, the, the greatest story, storyteller who has ever lived. And the Pharisees tell him, now is your, your, your time, Jesus. Choose grace or judgment. Do we kill her? Do we let her go? And y'all, like, Jesus knew this was a trap. And the greatest communicator, the greatest debater of all time, says nothing. 
except he does this. He looks at these Pharisees, and he does this. He leans down. He starts writing in the dirt. Uh, I, I'm no theologian. I, I didn't even go to college to study the Bible. I studied music. And I dug so deep into this story to try to figure out why is Jesus bending down to write in this dirt. There's so many theories out there. There's so many theories that say maybe he's writing the Ten Commandments. And I'm looking at that from someone who doesn't know this story very well. It doesn't understand the commentary behind it. I'm looking at this and thinking, that can't be it. Like, these Pharisees, these are the people that taught the Ten Commandments. Like, they can't just be told rules. Like, they create the rules. That's not going to do anything for their souls, for their hearts. So I don't think it was that. And there's even commentaries out there that talk about this feast that was happening before. And, and it, one part of that feast, there was this parade that would happen where they would correlate Jesus writing or God writing in the stain was him writing the book of time, him bringing living water to your soul and Jesus wiping away. And so a lot of people would say that Jesus was on the ground wiping away dust and saying that all sins are forgiven. That might be it. But Scripture never tells us why he was writing in the sand. And I wonder if we're missing the point if we focus so much on him leaning down and not what he does next. You see, he's writing in the sand. And then Scripture says this. Not only did he stand up, but it says that he straightens up. He stands in front of that woman. And he looks at these religious teachers, looks them square in the eye, face to face, and he is ready for war. He is ready to bring everything that Jesus is to this battle. And he looks at them and says, if you've never done anything wrong in your life, go ahead and throw your stone. Not one of them throws their stone. This is the reason why this story exists. The reason, or one of the reasons why the story exists is because we see Jesus on the ground with this woman. And this woman who was caught in her lowest moment, she cannot stand for herself. And so Jesus stands for her. If we're going to look at the story of Jesus and know what God believes, if we're going to look at the story of Jesus and know what we do for our lives, I think it's simply this, that we stand for those who cannot stand for themselves. That we stand for those who cannot stand for themselves. This is what Jesus does in this story. He sees this woman, this human that's being, uh, that's being made subhuman by these Pharisees. And he stands for her. This is what I love. <laughs> this is the craziest part. He then gets back down as if it's like nothing and starts writing in the sand again. And all these Pharisees, all these religious teachers, they drop their stones and they walk away. And then the story says the only people that were left was Jesus and this woman. And Jesus looks at her. This is the first time, y'all, she gets to speak in this, in this story. Jesus looks at her and says, do, do you see anybody here that's ready to kill you anymore? Do you see anyone here that's ready to judge you, to condemn you? They've all dropped their stones. Is there anyone else here that's ready to condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And Jesus says this. He says, and neither do I. So go. Go now. Leave this life of sin and go and sin no more. I think we overlook the verb of this, this sentence so quickly. Jesus does not tell her to stop and meditate and think about all the wrong things that she has done. Jesus looks at her and says, leave it and go. You see, we need to look at what surrounds us. We need to stand for those who cannot stand for themselves, but I think this is huge that Jesus sends us into the future. This is massive. This is the whole reason why this story exists in Scripture. He stands up for the person who can't stand, and he looks at them and says, go, go. 
not into your past, but into your future. I think the whole reason why Jesus did this is simply this. If Jesus is supposed to be a picture of what humanity is supposed to look like, then this tells me one thing, that God never sends us into our past. He always sends us into our future. He always calls us into our future, into the better part of our life. We have all made mistakes, but Jesus says to leave them where they're supposed to be in the past and to walk into a fully alive life. I heard this story this week, and I already had most of this outline written out, and our staff was at this this conference in, in L.A. this week, and I heard this amazing story, and it was almost like God to kind of like downloading this story in for, for this specific point in the message today. This man, his name was Jeremy Brown. He was an MLB player. He played baseball. He played baseball only for three seasons. This man looked more like a football player than he did a baseball player. This man was 6'1 and weighed 245 pounds. Big old guy. This man was known to pretty much hit bunts. Uh, He was known just to get other people on base. Uh, Jeremy Brown goes up for the third time ever to swing. Uh, The the pitcher pitches the, the ball, and Jeremy takes a swing, and he sees that his ball is flying. And we see something that Jeremy does that he never did before. You see, Jeremy usually would just casually walk to first base, run it out, get out. That was his job. But he saw there's potential in this ball that was just hit. And he, instead of running or casually strolling to first base, we see him round first base to start running towards second. People are cheering. Never seen this guy, this this massive man, run like this. And he starts running. People are cheering. And Jeremy goes over first base and he trips. Falls right on the ground face in the dirt in the YouTube video I watched there's people laughing all around him Jeremy stays there what almost seems like a lifetime he stays in that dirt and doesn't move this is what I love the first baseman from the other team he comes over to Jeremy he taps on him and you can see what he says just by like watching his mouth and he says bro get up It gets better. He says, get up because you hit a home run. See, Jeremy thought, this is the worst mistake of my life. I've had this opportunity and I fell flat on my face. What Jeremy didn't know is that that ball cleared 60 feet over the fence. Knocked it right out of the park. There might be times in our past where we started rounding first base for that new opportunity, that new job, that that new relationship, that new endeavor, and we fell so hard. The opportunity was taken from us. The debt started rolling in. The relationship was severed. The illness came. We feel like sometimes we are flat on our face in the dirt. It's Jesus who taps on us and says, bro, get up. Because Jesus has already hit a home run. And it's called our future. Jesus. Jesus never calls us into the past, but he always calls us into the future. So today, if we leave here today, Please remember that the highest calling, the calling that God has given you for your life, it is not dictated by the guilt and shame that you feel. It is not by the past mistakes, the moment mistakes, or the mistakes that you will make in the future. Your future is dictated by one person only, and that is Jesus. Because Jesus sends us into the future. He never calls us to our past but he always sends us into the great unknown, into the open journey that is the future. What would it look like in our lives if we did what Jesus did for this woman and lifts her up from the dust 
and calls her back into her fully alive life? What, it, what would it look like for us to stand for those who can't stand for themselves? What would it look like today for us to drop our stones of condemnation, of judgment, and walk away? And maybe not even walk away, but to drop that stone and come to that person and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did this to you. Maybe today we need to stop calling things out in people and call people into a better life. Maybe today you're sitting there going, Josh, I I tried everything there is. And I don't know who this person, this Jesus that you're talking about is, but what I do know is this. If I know anything about humanity, it's that we will fail time and time again. But there's something I know is so true. We have a God who has hit a home run that has called our future, that picks us up from the dust and calls us into a fully alive life. Maybe today can be that first day of the rest of your life. Maybe today you walk into that future and you leave your past behind and you walk into a life that only Jesus can give.